This is a Raketenwerfer. It verfs Raketen. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messi, and I'm here at the Fort Garry Horse Museum at McGregor Armories in Winnipeg, having a look at a relatively rare World War II German anti-tank weapon. This is a Raketenwerfer 43, better known as a Pipchen, or doll. Now, as the name implies, this was introduced in 1943 to give German infantrymen greater anti-armor capability, and it was one of the first weapons in the Wehrmacht arsenal that was capable of taking out pretty much any Allied tank of the time. Now, of course, the Germans at the time did have larger conventional uh, artillery pieces that had this capability. For example, the 75mm Pac-40 and the infamous 88mm flak gun. But of course, these weren't very portable for the average infantryman. And of course, the Germans did have a number of portable anti-tank weapons, including anti-tank rifles like the Panzerbüchse 38 and 39, the 30 millimeter Schiesbecher grenade discharger cup, which we discussed in my previous video on rifle grenades, uh, something called the Panzernacke, which was a shaped charge warhead with magnets that could be placed against the side of a tank, and finally, an earlier version of what later became known as the Panzerfaust, a recoilless disposable anti-tank weapon known as the Faustpatron. But the problem with these is that they either had very limited armor penetration, only up to about 140 millimeters, or they were very hazardous for an infantryman to use. The Panzernacke, for example, had to be physically placed by hand against the side of an enemy tank. The Raketenwerfer, on the other hand, had the range as well as the penetration, 230 millimeters of armor, a combination of which allowed it to become a very effective infantry weapon. Now, although this looks like a miniature artillery piece, this is actually a rocket launcher, and it fired a very similar projectile to the Raketenpanzerbüchse 43, also known as the Offenrohr, or stovepipe, but more famously known as the Panzerschreck, or tank terror, and this was basically the German 88 millimeter copy of the American bazooka. So both projectiles had the same shape charge warhead and fuse, but the projectile for the Pipchen was a little bit shorter and was ignited using a percussion cap rather than electrically in the Panzerschreck. It also had a small obturator cup over the rear fins in order to seal the breech. And unlike most rocket uh, weapons, this actually fires from a sealed breech like an artillery piece. Now, around 3,000 of these were produced until the Germans realized that they really didn't need something like this. Uh, this is very elaborate, it's very over-engineered, it's very German for what it was designed to do. If you're trying to launch a fin-stabilized rocket-propelled warhead at an enemy tank, you don't need a full artillery piece with a closing breech with a splinter shield and wheels and a trail and everything like that. You just need a tube with an igniter system, which is what the Panzerschreck was. Something like this was just far too complicated, far too slow, and far too expensive to mass produce compared to something like the Panzerschreck. So after producing around 3,000, they shut down production in favor of the Panzerschreck, of which they produced around 300,000, alongside some 7 million Panzerfaust. However, the Pipchens that were built weren't scrapped, they weren't taken out of service, they remained on the front lines until the very end of the war, mainly in entrenched or armored positions, such as specially built concrete bunkers. And this particular example was captured by the Fort Garry Horse, in Normandy around June 1944. Now, that's a very brief overview of the history of this weapon. Let's come in a little bit closer and see how it actually works. So as I said at the beginning, this fires from a closed breach, which, while unusual for a rocket-based weapon, gave it a significant advantage over the Panzerschreck, despite the latter being more economical to produce. By allowing the exhaust gases from the rocket to build up pressure in the chamber, uh, this could achieve a much higher muzzle velocity, giving it a greater range and a greater accuracy over that range. So, for example, the Panzerschreck had an effective range of around 160 meters, whereas this had an effective range of around 220 meters. 
Now, the official stated range of the Pipshin is around 700 meters, but since this uses regular open iron sights, you're really not going to be aiming at or effectively hitting anything at that range. So the actual practical range is closer to 200 meters. Now, to open the breech, you pull this handle, and it just pops open like that, and you'll notice that this is a relatively lightweight construction, and that's because it doesn't need to be any heavier, it's only containing relatively low-pressure rocket propellant gases. Same goes for the barrel, which is 88 millimeters in internal diameter, is smooth bore, and is made of relatively thin mild steel tubing. Now, to close the breech, you just hit the handle back like that, and that cocks the firing mechanism, which is this hammer that's sticking out the side here. And in order to fire the weapon, you take this spade grip right here, which is very similar to a heavy machine gun, and pull this trigger on the right-hand side. The hammer flips over, hits a firing pin, the firing pin hits the primer on the back of the rocket, and ignites the rocket motor. Now, despite this being set up as a you know, regular artillery piece, uh, this doesn't have the conventional hand-cranked wheels for elevation and traverse. Rather, you do this manually. So how this works is that you pull out this uh, locking pin at the front here, and you can lift the whole barrel out, and then you can traverse it and elevate it just like a heavy machine gun. And you've even got this big oleopneumatic damper on the side here in the elevation direction to help you elevate and depress this heavy barrel. Now, also, unlike a conventional artillery piece, this doesn't have any sort of recoil-absorbing mechanisms. There's no dampers or springs or anything like that. This relies merely on the weight of the whole gun carriage to absorb the recoil of the rocket firing. And unfortunately, this thing only weighs around 150 kilos, meaning that this thing kicked like a mule when you fired it. Now, as I said before, this has just iron sights, so we have this height-adjustable rear sight here, and then a front post mounted on a bracket just behind a hole in the splinter shield. Now, you'll notice right here on the splinter shield this little cross uh, marking here. And that is a calibration marking, and according to the manual, when you were first setting up the weapon for use, you would measure and make sure that the sight was a certain distance, vertical and horizontal, from the cross. Then you would make all of your adjustments from that default position. And on the other side of the splinter shield here, we have this handy little chart that gives you all your adjustments for both range and for temperature. Now, I haven't been able to find a source that says what the logic behind adjusting for temperature was, but I would imagine it has something to do with air density at different temperatures. So your rocket would have a different trajectory in cold, dense air as opposed to hot, less dense air. And you can see that this uh, goes all the way down to minus 30 degrees Celsius, meaning that this was intended for the depths of the Russian winter on the eastern front. And on the other side of this same little panel here, we have a handy guide to the weak points on a Russian T-34 tank. And I love the terminology here. These are referred to as Haltpunkt, which literally translates as halting or stopping point. So uh, very blunt, very literal. Now, another thing you've probably noticed in looking at the overall weapon is that each individual part is stenciled with its weight. And this is because this weapon, of all things, is a takedown weapon. You can actually pull out a bunch of these other release pins and break the gun down into seven or eight main assemblies, depending on whether you count the wheels individually or together. And this allowed the entire gun to be loaded onto a pack mule to be carried over rough terrain. So rather a handy feature to have, especially if you're, say, mountain troops or paratroops. And although at the beginning I said that this was far more unwieldy than a simple Panzerschreck, it definitely was, uh, this weapon really was no slouch in that department. Uh, despite it being this full gun carriage, it was light enough that two men could drag this over the battlefield pretty quickly and get it into place. So it was more of a mobile weapon than you would at first assume. Now, last couple of details on this end of the weapon. We've got some accessories. You'll see on this side we have the cleaning rods that screw together. On the front of the gun we have two cylindrical compartments for the cleaning brushes that go on the end of these. We have brackets here for a crate containing three rounds of ammunition, and also brackets on the front splinter shield to hold two more. So when this was all limbered up and in transport position, you would be able to hold 
uh, three boxes of ammunition for a total of nine rounds. So two last details in this particular gun. If you've ever seen a picture of a Pipshin in action, you probably noticed that this one is missing its most distinctive feature, which is its conical flash hider. This would have been made out of simple welded sheet metal and would have been held onto the barrel using a ring clamp. Now, interestingly enough, contrary to what you might expect, the flash hider typically wasn't mounted to project beyond the muzzle, but was rather mounted a little farther back so that the end of the cone was flush with the muzzle, presumably to just reduce the overall length of the weapon. Now, another neat detail very specific to this example is right here, you can see some battle damage. So at some point, the splinter shield was hit by a large caliber projectile, probably a 50 caliber machine gun bullet, and that punctured straight through and ricocheted along the trunnion, leaving a couple of gouges. So this just goes to show this wasn't sitting in some storage depot when it was captured in June 1944. This actually saw some action. So this particular example actually has a bit of a funny story behind it. For years, this was brought out during Christmas parties and used to shoot flaming rolls of toilet paper and fireworks and things like that. And the armory here also has a Goliath track demolition vehicle in its collection, and that was fitted with seats and hand controls so you could drive it around the armory. But after a while, the heritage officer put his foot down and said we shouldn't be abusing and destroying these important artifacts, and both underwent a complete restoration, which is how we came to have this beautifully preserved example to look at today. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. A big shout out to Gord Crossley of the Fort Garry Horse Museum for allowing me access to this unique piece of weapons history. And thank you so much to all of you, my viewers, for all the love and support you've shown me. If you saw my last video, you know what I've been going through lately. And just again, thank you for your patience. Thank you for all the support. I really appreciate it. It's really helped get me through this tough time. Anyway, I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on our own devices, where we'll look at yet more fascinating artifacts just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier. Have a great day.